We're glad you're here. It's a neat opportunity to look into the Word. We're in 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 51 through 58, and we probably won't go that far today, but what we're going to do is talk about a very familiar section of Scripture. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into it. Lord, thanks for your Word. Take your Word and apply it to our hearts in a way that best causes us to grow and bear the kind of results that you desire. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 51, may be very familiar to you. It seems like if you spent any time listening to preaching and stuff, you will have heard this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. And as you go through these verses and, and stuff, perhaps that starts you off on listening to all, thinking about all of this that's, that comes after. But we're going to take, and I've been accused of kind of rambling sometimes, so I'm going to ramble. I'm going to talk to you about some of the details of this. And as we start off, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery in the Bible is a secret that's been hidden until God revealed it. Now, if you look in Daniel chapter 2, you'll find the story of, of Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And when Daniel and his friends were young, they were <clears throat> captured and taken to Babylon. And apparently King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would get young, promising people from every kingdom that he conquered and bring them to Babylon and train them in their science and then use them as advisors and as, as, uh, as, as counselors for his plans, what he, what he proposed to do. And so this happened to Daniel and his friends. Well, when the king had something that bothered him, or something that was on his mind, he would ask for counsel. And one time he had a dream, and in this dream, he was shown some things, and he understood it, that it had meaning, and he needed to know what it meant, and he came up with a test. Here's how we'll know that you're telling me what it really means. He says, you counselors, and he had the senior advisors there. He said, you, you advisors, you counselors, tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what it means. If you can tell me what I dreamed, I know you'll know what it means. Well, they said, Nobody can do that. And he, and, and he said, you're going to do it. He said, if you don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe you guys all out and start fresh. And they said, nobody can do this. And he said, okay, this is the edict. Either do it or you're done. And he sent out the order to start killing off the counselors. He was going to wipe them out. Well, of course, they came and they knocked on Daniel's door. They came to him and his friends and they were getting ready. They said, you guys are going to die too. And Daniel said, give us some time. Let us have the night to, to ask God to reveal it to us. And he went before the king, asked for some time. When he did this without just stalling, but saying, if you'll give us time, let's see if we can come up with your answer. The king granted them the time. In the night, the Lord answered their request. So you get in Daniel chapter 2, verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. And there's that word again. Here's an unknown thing that God knows, and they're going to ask him for an answer so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel prayed. He's, before they ever went to the king and reported that they had his answer, he said to the Lord, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and epochs. It means he's in charge of stuff. He's the one that causes something to come about or causes the timing of something to be so. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. That's an important thing. In the Bible, when it refers to light, many times it's referring to 
the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding of things, the the way that that someone comes to a true knowledge of what's really going on. Um, John 1, 4 says about Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. When someone found the life that Jesus offered, they gain understanding of God and of how things were in life and how things related to the Creator. These things came as a result of God in them. So he says, the light dwells with him, the understanding, the wisdom, the the things that makes life make sense comes from God. If you read Psalm 36, verses one through four, and I'm, I'm going to Psalm 36, and this seems like a stretch maybe, but Psalm 36, just I've read it many, many times, but recently it came to mean something entirely different and new. In Psalm 36, the first four verses talk about someone without God and how it says they're able to fool themselves. They don't even know themselves well. Listen to what it says. Psalm 36, verse 1, transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. So he's already off kilter because he doesn't fear God. The sin that he's harbored makes him not see God correctly. Verse 2, for it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. He says he's fooled thinking, I can hide this stuff. Nobody will know. Nobody will hate what I'm doing. Verse 3, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. It soon consumes him so that the times when he's not doing the wickedness, he's thinking of how to cause it to be. And it says, he sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. This leads him in a way that's not going to turn out well. But it's this where it says he flatters himself in his own eyes. It tells that he fools himself. He thinks he's so clever that he's got everything hidden, that he can do his dirty work and gain the benefits without anybody knowing or catching him. He doesn't even know himself well. But then David goes on to say what's different from that, from someone who doesn't know the truth, is the God who reveals the truth, and it's centered in the Lord himself. Verses 5 through 9. Your loving kindness, in contrast to this one who is trying to get along on his own, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. The love of God is steady, never failing, dependable and immense. It's love that has no limits. Knowing God is when you hook into this kind of love. Verse 6, your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. When he says, I'm, I want to describe something huge, he looks at the mountains that surrounded Jerusalem. He looks at the massive mountains. He says, oh, there's no limits to God's rightness, his righteousness. Your judgments are like the great deep. He looks at the ocean and says, oh, your judgments are deep. Your wisdom is deep. And he go, it goes on. Oh, Lord, you preserve man and beast. He says, our very existence is dependent on you. What you supply is what sustains us. How precious is your loving kindness, O oh God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Where's the place of safety? The closer you get to God. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house. You give them to drink of the river of your delights. One of the things that you're sometimes told is that God doesn't want you enjoying yourself, and yet the river of his delights, we're told in the New Testament that God gives us all things to enjoy. When we have joy, he created in us the capacity to enjoy, and then he supplies the things that bring that joy. He wants us to appreciate and experience the joy of what he's created. Then verse 9 says this, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Daniel said, with him is a place of light. He says, when we finally see light, it's because it's you that we see. Your light shows us what light is supposed to look like. 
First Timothy 6 and verse 17 says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty or conceited, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And then he goes on and says, do you understand that? God supplies what we enjoy. And then he says, with you as a fountain of life, what makes life worthwhile comes from you. And in your light, we see light. It means all light comes from you. When we see true light, we look at you. In contrast to the make-believe world, that someone who thinks they're so smart and flatters himself and builds up an imaginary fantasy of what they're like, the truth of real light is in God. In fact, Psalm 25 and verse 14 says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. In other words, he will reveal the deep and inner meaning of his connection, his promises to us. So back in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. How do we know what is being revealed? He says, I'm going to reveal something to you now that God has previously kept secret. It's real. It's true. It's from God. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15, where Paul is talking about the same subject, the coming of Christ to receive his believers to himself, Paul says, here's what I got from the word. This is the word of the Lord. It's his word. He's the one who reveals this. So, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We're not all going to sleep. And the Bible talks about sleep, about the death of a believer, as if they've gone to sleep. Well, here's the truth. For a believer, death is like sleep. Their bodies lay down. The word cemetery means the place where people lie down, a place of rest. It's where you come to be laid to rest, they call it. Well, the the secret is that we won't all sleep. Some will be alive when Jesus comes back. Others will be asleep. And the reason a believer's life is likened to sleep is because it includes a wake-up call. There will come a time when the Lord says, all right, time to get up. And for those who are dead, whose bodies are laid down in Christ, there will come a time when the trumpet will sound, a loud voice will say, get up and we'll go. God's intention has always been that those who believe in Jesus Christ would actually get the eternal life that God promised. But we know from verse 50 in 1 Corinthians 15 or that it requires an extreme overhaul of these environmental suits that we're born in. And basically, that's what your body is, is an environmental suit that's made so that you can operate here. You can use organic material to to, uh, to uh, fuel it. You breathe the atmosphere. You use it to pick up things, do things, work, do the thing. The real self of you is inside, though. Your brain is a computer that runs this body, that you're connected to your inner self, but your inner self is independent. That soul is the real mind of the person, the real place where you occupy. And this body is going to finally be done and lay down. If the Lord has not come back with yet, we'll be laid into the ground. In 2 Corinthians 5, and you can read this in verses 2 and verse 4 especially, it says, we're not desiring that we just be Outside this body, we'd, we'd just be left naked as without the clothing of a body. And he's, what he's trying to say is, our desire is not to just be out of here, but to be there. He doesn't say, we want to be fully clothed. We want to be equipped to be able to explore and enjoy that new place, the place that God prepared for us. We want to experience it, and that'll require a new body that has been changed. And the fun thing is here, he says, in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, so fast that your eye can't follow it, there'll be a sound, a trumpet sound. The trumpet will truly sound. We'll hear it, the shofar, the ram's horn, possibly. But we're going to hear it as a real sound. And then it says, the dead will be raised imperishable. And here's the word. The word imperishable is a word that means 
it cannot rot, it cannot decay, it cannot deteriorate, it cannot age. Imperishable is a great word. Now, the dead are said to be asleep. If you read in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43, and especially in, in, in the middle verses, Jesus has been informed that Jairus, a synagogue official, his daughter is sick, and while they're still talking, the daughter dies. When Jesus shows up at Jairus' house, he says, why are you mourning? She's just asleep. And everybody just starts laughing and mocking him and saying he doesn't know anything. He walks in and he raises her up. He calls her back, just like she'd been sleeping. He's the Lord of life. Then you get to John 11. You read in verses 1 through 46 about Lazarus. And Jesus and his disciples are in a place. Someone sends word that Lazarus back home is sick. Looks like he's not going to make it. Jesus doesn't hurry back to Lazarus. And at one point he tells his disciples, Lazarus has gone to sleep. And they say, oh, good thing he's resting. Maybe he'll get better. And he says, no, I mean, he died. But we're going to, so you can see the works of God. And they go back and Jesus calls him out of the grave. He's been buried for four days. Jesus calls him back. The wake up call from death, Jesus showed it again and again and demonstrated that there'll come a wake up call for us who are in Christ who have died when he calls us back from the grave. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, it says this, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. He says, you don't look at death the same way when you have the hope of eternal life in Christ. But the dead in Christ have an uncorruptible body, an unignorable wake-up call. There's a future and a hope that is in Christ. They're going to be raised, never to be destroyed again, imperishable. Never to be corrupt or decay again. Never to spoil again. That's going to be the new mode of life. It's going to be entirely different from here. Now, that's a major upgrade. He says, I tell you a mystery. And then he starts telling you all these things that are included in the mystery. We won't all die. We will all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, before we can even see it happen, we're going to be changed. We'll be from this to that. At the last trumpet, because there is going to be a trumpet call, and then the dead are going to be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's as far as we're going to go in here. Think about this. You talk about a major upgrade. There's going to come a time when we're going to be changed into something that's entirely different from this. Without the degrading, without the dying, without the downhill thing that comes as we age and get older and older. This is God's plan. It's his plan to redeem and bring us to himself. The eternal life that Jesus promised when he talked to the people as he taught and stuff is amazing because as he was telling this, he knew all of the rest of this, but he did only revealed a bit at a time, a bit at a time. John 3, 16, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The everlasting life is in fact, including the remaking of our bodies the eternal life as a new and glorified person, as a person who is fit to walk on the streets of gold and celebrate the eternal light in the presence of God. These are what we're called to in eternal life. It's exciting stuff. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we've given some attention to these verses. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to apply them to heart so that, in fact, we would not be discouraged, that we would realize, yes, it's sad to have a temporary separation from someone, but in Christ, it is temporary. There'll come a wake-up call in which, in which we will be joined together in glorified bodies before God. It's exciting. Thank you. Now, help us to walk in that truth and to realize the hope that's before it and to share the good news as often as we get an opportunity to. And I would pray for any who are listening who don't know the Lord. This is something that comes 
with a relationship through Jesus Christ to God. He died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried in the ground and then raised, according to the scripture. And his resurrection is the promise of life for us. Help us that people would believe and know the Lord as God and find the fulfillment and the future that God's given. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Think on these things. It's okay to get excited. It's okay to look forward to them. There's a lot going on in the world that's rough. I understand that. There's a lot of people that criticize that don't believe. It doesn't make it not true. Not believing doesn't make something not true. And you listen to it. You watch it. You see what God said. And this is it. This is good. Hope to see you next time. We'll talk about it some more.